Thank you, Brian, and good morning to everyone, and welcome to those, all of us, who are joining remotely today to participate in the Consumer Financial uh, Protection, in the Bureau's Consumer Financial Protection Week. Throughout this week, the Bureau is hosting a series of events on how we protect consumers in the financial marketplace, highlight some of the key issues consumers are confronting, and inform consumers how they can communicate to the Bureau concerns that they may have with a financial services provider. My name, as Brian said, is Kirsten Sutton, and I am very proud to serve as the Bureau's Chief of Staff. In a moment, I have the honor of introducing the Bureau's Director, Kathy Craninger, who will provide opening remarks for today's session. But before I do so, let me tell you a little bit about what you can expect um, for the next hour. Following the Director's remarks, Brian Schneider, who is the Bureau's Associate Director for Supervision, Enforcement, and Fair Lending, also known as CEPL, will provide an overview of the Bureau's supervisory and enforcement work during the pandemic. After Brian concludes his comments, we'll have some time for a very brief Q&A. And with that, I'm now pleased to direct introduce, or to introduce Director Kathy Craninger. Director Craninger became the second confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in December of 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role establishing the Department of Homeland Security, to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget, and now to the CFPB, Director Craninger has dedicated her entire career to public service. Please join me in welcoming her to today's event. Director Craninger, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for that introduction. Thank you all for joining us today for the continuation of the events of Consumer Financial Protection Week. Today is our third day of events, and I hope that you have found them as valuable as I have. Uh, a lot of great information conveyed uh, about the fantastic work that the Bureau does uh, each and every day. Uh, I am delighted to be here today to talk with you about supervision and enforcement activities and efforts during the challenging times uh, surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. I can say before the pandemic, I started gearing the Bureau toward a laser focus on prevention of consumer harm. We prevent harm by having clear rules of the road for uh, regulated entities. We prevent harm by supporting dynamic and competitive markets that provide for consumer choice. We prevent harm by using supervision and enforcement that we'll talk about today to promote compliance with the law. And we prevent harm by educating consumers to make informed decisions for themselves. Preventing harm remains the right goal in the face of the pandemic and the economic impact surrounding it. And all the divisions of the Bureau have switched gears to, in real time to keep pace with the rapidly changing landscape. This includes promoting a culture of compliance through our supervisory tool and continuing to maintain a backstop of enforcement through our enforcement tool. Uh, many times inside the Bureau, I have stated that supervision is the heart of the agency. And indeed, the Bureau's Division of Supervision, Enforcement, and Fair Lending, or CEPL, as uh, Kirsten said, it's known inside the Bureau, comprises the largest division and is led by Associate Director Brian Schneider, uh, who you will hear from shortly. And our examiners have been stationed across the U.S. since the Bureau started in its earliest days with regional offices in the, Met, the West, Midwest, East, and South, Southeast, uh, Northeast and Southeast. So when it came to sustaining continued CEPL operations, the divisions did not miss a beat uh, in transitioning to telework, which many of them are home duty stations, and continuing examinations. Uh, most importantly, the Bureau had a clear blueprint, blueprint for how to operate at optimal capacity because CEPL has been doing just that uh, since its beginning. This means our supervisory teams continue to perform examinations and other supervisory work remotely. It's become clear that the pandemic was having a substantial effect on the offering of consumer financial products and services, and it's a substantial effect on related consumer risks. For that reason, we developed a new targeted supervisory approach called prioritized assessments. These assessments focus on those markets and institutions that pose the greatest risk to consumer harm as a result of pandemic-related issues. Prioritized assessments which we conduct alongside uh, some traditional examinations, albeit remote, are higher level inquiries than traditional exams, focused on obtaining real-time information from these entities and in these markets. Through prioritized assessments, the Bureau is expanding supervisory oversight to a greater universe of institutions 
gaining a greater understanding of industry responses to pandemic-related challenges, and helping to ensure that entities are attentive to practices that may result in consumer harm. Brian's going to go into substantial detail around that and have a conversation with Kirsten about it, um, it shortly. Our enforcement teams are also on the job and remain committed to vigorously enforcing consumer financial protection laws in all markets under our jurisdiction. The pandemic does not change that. Uh, every case is managed by a career professional attorneys seeking justice in the public interest. In today's environment, we are taking and will continue to take swift action when we identify companies or individuals that violate the law to exploit the current economic uncertainty. We won't hesitate to take public enforcement action as appropriate against companies or individuals engaged in unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, or otherwise violate consumer financial law. Our efforts include working with our state and federal partners on a constant basis to identify potential violations within our jurisdiction. And we are actively investigating and taking legal action against potentially wrong, wrongful or dangerous uh, financial practices related to the pandemic, including some based on patterns in complaints submitted by consumers. In closing, I wanna tell you that the pandemic has affected much about how the Bureau staff does its work. Much of the Bureau staff is teleworking uh, for the safety, from the safety of their own homes, yet the pandemic has done nothing to diminish our commitment to protecting consumers. Let me commend the Bureau staff who work tirelessly to achieve our mission, and we stand together to use all of the tools that Congress gave us to go after bad actors that break the law and prevent harm in the first place. We are really building a culture of compliance where entities understand the rules of the road and consumers understand their rights, protections, and options. And frankly, I thank all of you who are joining us today because you all play a role in that, whether you're regulated entities or consumer advocates or bureau staff, federal state partners, uh, we all play a very important role in ensuring uh, that consumer protections are in place in the marketplace. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today and look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Director. And at this time, I'm pleased to introduce Brian Schneider, who is, again, our Associate Director for the Bureau's Division of Supervision, Enforcement, and Fair Lending, which we refer to as CEPL. Brian joined the Bureau on the heels of spending four years as a member of the Illinois Governor's Cabinet. As Secretary of the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, he was responsible for regulation and licensure oversight of more than 4,000 state chartered banks, credit unions, and non-depository financial institutions, including supervision efforts. As CEPHAL Associate Director, he leads the Bureau's largest division and has been an integral part of the Director's Senior Leadership Team since he joined the Bureau in October of 2019. Brian, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you, Director Kraniger and Kirsten, for your opening remarks. Uh, I also wish to add my thanks to the many, many uh, dedicated members of the CEPL team uh, about whose great work I have the privilege of reporting this morning. I am Brian Schneider, the Associate Director for CEPL, and the division I head is responsible for the Bureau's supervision of banks and non-banks and the enforcement of federal consumer financial protection law. Accordingly, I am responsible for implementing two of the Bureau's tools, supervision and enforcement. My plan for today is to talk to you about these tools and how the Bureau is using them to ensure that consumers are protected during the current pandemic. In doing so, I will also go over some of the Bureau's current supervisory activities in the student loan servicing market and recent successes in the enforcement context, including the Bureau's important settlement with Equifax. I want to start by going over the Bureau's current supervisory efforts. The director, as she noted, views supervision as the heart of the agency, and this is indeed reflected in our staffing. We are the first agency with supervisory and enforcement authority over both banks and non-banks to oversee compliance with federal consumer financial protection laws. We seek to use our supervisory authority consistently 
to promote a culture of compliance at the banks and non-depository institutions we supervise. Through supervision, we conduct examinations and require reports from institutions subject to our supervisory authority to assess their compliance with federal consumer financial law, obtain information about their activities and compliance systems, and assess and detect risks to consumers and to markets for consumer financial products or services. One of the great strengths of the Bureau's supervision tool is that we can use it to prevent violations of laws and regulations from happening. And to best achieve that, we regularly prioritize our supervisory resources where we see the greatest risk to consumers through an annual prioritization process. As a result, we are adapting our supervision program to meet the needs of the current crisis. Because the direct impact of COVID-19 and associated relief efforts have significantly changed the financial marketplace, we have reevaluated our supervisory approach and priorities during this time. Specifically, we are rescheduling about half of our planned examination work the next quarter of exam. Instead of conducting that previously planned examination work, we will conduct what we are calling prioritized assessments. Prioritized assessments are higher level inquiries than traditional examinations designed to obtain real-time information from entities that operate in markets posing elevated risk of consumer harm due to pandemic-related issues. Through prioritized assessments, the Bureau will expand its supervisory oversight to cover a greater number of institutions than our typical examination schedule would allow, gain a greater understanding of industry responses to pandemic-related challenges, and help ensure that entities are attentive to practices that may result in violations of federal consumer financial law or consumer harm. Specifically, we assessed our exams scheduled for the third quarter of this year to determine whether entities were able to support a full scope examination in light of operational challenges resulting from the pandemic, whether the planned scope of these exams made sense in the light of the current crisis, and whether examiners would be able to carry out a full scope examination from their home duty station. We are currently undergoing a similar assessment for examinations scheduled for the remainder of 2020. We deferred, as I mentioned, about half of our scheduled third quarter examinations and replaced them with prioritized assessments. We will use prioritized assessments to identify risk of violations of federal consumer financial law and consumer harm, particularly in those markets that may be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and to identify whether follow-up work is necessary. This inquiry into the risk of violations of federal consumer financial law and consumer harm impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic is narrower than the Bureau's more typical examination work in its time period of review and scope, focusing on the most recent few months and pandemic-related issues. In conducting these prioritized assessments, we will focus our efforts on where we believe the risk are highest to consumers who are having trouble making loan payments due to lost income or other financial shock. We are also prioritizing markets where Congress provided special provisions to help consumers in the CARES Act. That means some of the top risk areas we will be looking at are mortgage servicing, consumer reporting and furnishing, auto loan servicing, student loan servicing, and collection. Now, I want to be careful to note that while federal consumer financial law includes the CARES Act's amendments to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the CARES Act itself is not a federal consumer financial law. Still, an institution could violate the CARES Act in a way that also violates the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010's 
prohibition on unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. And we can also look at an institution's activities that are subject to the CARES Act under the other prongs of our supervisory authority. To give you a sense of what we are doing with our prioritized assessments across our markets, I want to provide you with a little background on what we are doing with student loan servicers. The Bureau's supervisory authority in this market extends to larger participant non-bank student loan servicers as defined by Bureau rule and banks with more than $10 billion in total assets and their affiliates who service student loans. Student loans are a critical product in the consumer financial services marketplace and present unique challenges in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, associated economic shocks, and relief efforts. Specifically, the pandemic created operational and logistical challenges for student loan servicers, while borrowers are facing job loss and mounting bills forcing difficult financial choices. Even before the crisis, borrowers in this space were struggling to understand the range of repayment and payment relief options across direct, felt, and private student loans. Against this backdrop, and when paired with the market's large size, consumer complaint data, news reports, and other information, we see indicia of risk to consumers as a result of the pandemic but the extent of any risk remains unknown. To better understand these risks and ensure institutions comply with their obligations, the Bureau is sending prioritized assessments to a range of student loan servicers. These prioritized assessments will focus on the operational and logistical challenges servicers face and payment relief options for consumers experiencing economic shock. Each of the student loan servicers that we select for a prioritized assessment will receive a targeted information request from us that is specific to the market, the market's unique risk to consumers, and the institution itself. The information request will cover information necessary to help us better understand what new or pre-existing payment relief options are available to consumers, how consumers are communicating these repayment options to consumers, and to analyze operational risk of servicers in executing on programs designed to help consumers manage financial difficulties. We may also look at the student loan servicers furnishing activities, including compliance with the CARES Act amendments to FICRA as part of our prioritized assessment of the institution. We are coordinating with federal student aid on this effort and look forward to evaluating the responses we receive related to both private and federally owned loans. You may now be wondering whether, where the CARES Act student loan payment relief fits into our prioritized assessments of student loan servicer. By way of background, the CARES Act suspends borrower payments and interest accrual for six months on federally owned student loans and provides for borrowers to receive credit towards loan forgiveness during those months of suspended payments. Although the CARES Act, as I've mentioned, is not itself a federal consumer financial law, the Bureau is able to examine an institution's student loan servicing activities, including those under the CARES Act, pursuant to the Bureau's supervisory authority. Rest assured that we plan to look at all pandemic-related servicing activities, including execution of the CARES Act, as part of our prioritized assessments so that we can better assess risks to consumers. Where these assessments demonstrate that servicers may be failing to comply with federal consumer financial law, we will follow up as needed to protect borrowers. Prioritized assessments are ongoing. We have sent information requests in the highest risk areas and will continue to send requests in additional priority markets in the next few months. 
Although the exact timing of our assessments is not certain, we intend to complete our assessments over the coming months. In certain instances, follow-up work may continue depending on the information obtained and the risk assessment itself. As noted, although we rescheduled about half of our planned exams in this quarter to conduct prioritized assessments, much of our more typical examination work remains ongoing. Our exam staff has quickly and effectively adapted to conducting supervisory activities from their home duty stations. For those examinations, the Bureau has not rescheduled to conduct its prioritized assessment work. Examiners have continued to review documents and information, hold discussions with institution personnel, CFPB stakeholders, and sister regulatory agencies, and submit follow-up questions and requests to supervised entities. But it's important that I acknowledge that remote examinations have presented challenges in communicating with entity personnel and delays in receiving information from entities. For example, as financial institutions themselves have migrated to, remote, to a remote workforce, their employees' remote access to certain systems and processes is sometimes less robust which has led to challenges in their ability to produce documents and information. In many instances, examiners have not been able to arrange remote access for Bureau staff into certain entity, in certain entity systems, resulting in additional difficulty in completing certain areas of review. In the face of changing circumstances, continued communication is key. There is typically ongoing monitoring and dialogue between CFPB central points of contact and supervised institutions, which should help examiners stay informed about ongoing changes at the institution. Our examiners, staff, and I are committed to maintaining the ongoing monitoring and dialogue with all supervised institutions. Let me now pivot to the Bureau's enforcement tool. Enforcement is an essential tool that Congress gave the Bureau, particularly because education, rulemaking, and supervision will not prevent every violation. In addition to making consumers whole for past harms, public enforcement actions stop ongoing consumer harm and prevent future harm. Public actions can also deter companies and individuals who are not parties to the action. To ensure deterrence with respect to all markets under the Bureau's authority, it is important that public enforcement actions cover a complete array of products and markets, as well as types of entities. As a result, our public enforcement actions in the past year have involved a variety of products, markets, and entities, including depositories and non-depositories, companies, and individuals. Our enforcement tool is critical to the mission of the Bureau, and we are working hard to ensure that the matters we, are, we bring not only make injured consumers whole, but also deter companies and, and individuals that may otherwise consider violating the law. We currently have a significant number of open, non-public investigations being handled by enforcement staff. In addition, we are currently litigating 26 cases, including matters on appeal. In 2019, the Bureau announced 22 public enforcement actions settled six previously filed lawsuits and obtained a final judgment in one previously filed lawsuit. These actions resulted in an over $750 million in total consumer relief, over $600 million in consumer redress, and over $150 million in other relief, and over $200 million in civil monetary penalties before adjusting for suspended amounts. 
In 2019, our actions included matters relating to debt relief, debt collection, payday loans, student loans, credit reporting, mortgage servicing, credit cards, credit repair, remittances, and more. In 2020, we continue to build on this record. We've announced 13 public enforcement actions so far this year, including eight contested lawsuits. For example, we have filed several lawsuits against student loan debt relief operations this year. On January 9th, we filed a lawsuit against Monster Loans and other entities that were involved in offering student loan debt relief services. In May, we reached a settlement with multiple key defendants in that, litiga in that litigation. The settlement includes an $18 million redress judgment and a civil money penalty of approximately $450,000. And just this week, we brought an action against GST factoring and related individuals and entities. These defendants were part of a nationwide student loan debt relief operation that charged thousands of consumers saddled with private student loan debt approximately $11.8 $8 million in illegal upfront fees. We settled with several individual defendants in that matter and are pursuing a lawsuit against the remaining defendants. We have filed several additional lawsuits this year as well. For example, we filed a lawsuit against Citizens Bank in January. We allege that among other things, citizens violated TILA and Regulation Z by failing to properly manage and respond to credit card disputes. In March, we filed a lawsuit against Fifth Third Bank. There, we alleged, among other things, that Fifth Third violated the CFPA, TILA, and the Truth in Savings Act by opening unauthorized accounts without consumers' consent. In May, we partnered with the Massachusetts Attorney General to file a lawsuit against Key Credit Repair and its owner. We allege that Key Credit Repair violated the CFPA and TSR in its telemarketing of credit repair services. At the beginning of this month, we filed a lawsuit against My Loan Doctor and its founder. We allege that the defendants made several false marketing representations in advertising Loan Doctor's savings accounts. And just yesterday, we filed a lawsuit against Townstone Financial, a non-bank retail mortgage creditor based in Chicago, for violations of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, its implementing Regulation B, and the CFPA by engaging in discriminatory mortgage lending practices. Also this year, we have pursued several actions against small dollar lenders. On April 1st, we announced a settlement with Cottonwood Financial, which does business as Cash Store. Cash Store offers high interest payday, auto title, and unsecured consumer installment loans from roughly 340 stores in seven different states. We found that in the course of marketing, servicing, and collecting on their loans, Cash Store violated the CFPA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and TILA. The consent order requires Cash Store to pay over $1.3 million in redress and penalties. On June 2nd, we announced a settlement with Main Street Personal Finance and ACAC that does business as approved cash advance and quick lend. These companies offer payday and auto title loans from about 156 stores in eight different states. We found that approved cash advance provided deceptive finance charge disclosures and failed to refund overpayments in violation of the CFPA and TILA and also violated the CFPA by engaging in unfair debt collection practices. Approved cash advance is required to pay $2 million 
for consumer redress. Other enforcement activities this year have included matters involving mortgage servicing, credit reporting, and debt relief. And we have many more enforcement actions that we are working on and expect to announce before the end of the year. In one area of recent focus, the Bureau brought, brought four actions in 2019 and early 2020 against a total of six entities and five individuals that preyed on veterans, many of whom were disabled. The defendants in these actions offered a lump sum payment ranging from a few thousands to tens of thousands of dollars in exchange for the rights to a consumer's future pension or disability payment. The consumer's obligations under these contracts lasted five to 10 years, and by the end, the consumer paid or would have paid back far more than what they received in the beginning. The defendants even required consumers to purchase life insurance policies so that if the consumer should die, the outstanding amount on the contract would still be paid. Federal and state law prohibit agreements like these, where a person acquires the right to receive a veteran's pension payment, but the defendants in these actions repeatedly told veterans that these actions were legal. Even though the contracts were not valid or enforceable, the defendants not only collected on them, but even sued some consumers to collect amounts, amounts due and threatened criminal prosecution if consumers failed to make payments. In our action, we allege that the defendants' practices were deceptive and unfair, and we seek injunctive relief redress to consumers, and civil monetary penalties. Several of the defendants have settled with the Bureau, and the Bureau's Civil Penalty Fund has already allocated close to $12 million to consumers who have been harmed. We are currently litigating against several other defendants. We brought these actions in partnership with the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs and the Arkansas Attorney General's Office. We regularly coordinate with state and federal regulators, and these actions are an example of such important partnerships. Protecting veterans and individuals who are disabled from predatory practices is an important part of the Bureau's mission. We hope that these cases have sent a message to the industry that the Bureau will take action to stop such illegal practices. Another enforcement action that I wanted to discuss today is our action against Equifax. About a year ago, on July 22nd, 2019, the Bureau, along with the Federal Trade Commission, 48 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico, announced a global settlement with Equifax for the data breach that exposed the personal information of approximately 147 million American consumers. The settlement provides up to $700 million in monetary relief and penalties. Following an investigation, the Bureau alleged that Equifax violated the CFPA before and after the breach through unfair and deceptive practices. The settlement with the Bureau provides up to $425 million in monetary relief to consumers, a $100 million civil money penalty, and other relief. In addition, Equifax is required to make significant improvements to its data security practices. The initial claims period for this settlement ended on January 22, 2020. Consumers had until that date to fill a claim to receive the credit monitoring product offered under the settlement or for reimbursement for any time spent or money lost before this deadline. We are now in a four-year extended claims period, which ends on January 22, 2024. Consumers may submit additional claims 
for certain losses that occur during this period. I encourage all consumers to go to www.equifaxbreachsettlement.com to see if they were affected by the Equifax breach and to file a claim during the extended claims period if applicable to them. In addition, under the settlement, all U.S. consumers are entitled to up to six free credit reports annually for the next seven years. Consumers can access these reports by enrolling at www.myequifax.com or on www.annualcreditreport.com without the need to enroll with Equifax. This is in addition to any free report to which consumers are entitled under federal law, as well as the weekly reports that Equifax, along with Experian and TransUnion, are currently offering to help Americans in response to COVID-19. The settlement administrator is currently receiving and verifying claims. Because this settlement was part of a global resolution, including the FTC, 48 state attorneys general, and a private class action, the court needs to rule in the private class action to finalize the settlement before claims start being paid out. That process is ongoing, but as soon as it is completed, consumers will receive an email with information about how to activate their credit monitoring services and will also receive their reimbursements by mail. As you can see, the COVID-19 pandemic has not affected the Bureau's ability or resolve to use its enforcement tool to police the consumer financial marketplace. Our enforcement team is on the job and committed to vigorously enforcing consumer financial protection laws in all markets under our jurisdiction. We are monitoring the marketplace in real time and coordinating on an ongoing basis with fellow federal and state regulators who are similarly committed to stopping COVID-19-related malfeasance. As we have stated previously, our enforcement activities will take into account current staffing and related resource challenges confronting financial institutions. We will consider the circumstances that entities face as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and will be sensitive to good faith efforts demonstrably designed to assist consumers. While the Bureau is mindful of challenges faced by institutions, however, we will not hesitate to take public enforcement action when appropriate against companies or individuals that engage in unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices, discriminate, or otherwise violate federal consumer financial protection laws in order to take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic. To help us monitor the marketplace, we encourage consumers to submit complaints online. Complaints give us insights into problems people are experiencing in the marketplace and help us enforce federal consumer financial laws. We also encourage current or former employees, contractors, vendors, and competitor companies to report potential violations of federal consumer financial law. Whistleblowers can contact the Bureau at whistleblower at cspb.gov. Today, I've discussed just some of the, of the enforcement team's recent actions. We currently have a large number of non-public investigations open as we continue to closely monitor the market for illegal conduct. I expect that there will be many more public enforcement actions to come in 2020 relating to a number of different markets and products. That concludes my remarks about the Bureau's supervisory and enforcement tools. But before we turn to Q&A session, the Q&A session with Kirsten, 
I want to emphasize that the Bureau appreciates the commitment of everyone coming together during this challenging time. We are all in this together, and the role of coordinating with our federal, state, and local partners and working with the wide range of Bureau stakeholders is more important than ever. So Kirsten, is it time to move to Q&A? Thank you, Brian. You have covered quite a bit of ground, but it is time to move to Q&A. We are not done yet. So I have a few questions for you about the work that you've described. Are you ready? I am. Let's do it. Okay, first question. What is the process for requesting an extension of time to respond to a targeted information request? That's a good question, and we've received it um, from a number of stakeholders. But institutions needing an extension of time to respond to our targeted information request should request an extension from the examiner in charge of the prioritized assessment. Bureau examiners are committed to working with institutions throughout the prioritized assessment process and are being eminently reasonable and considering and granting institution's extension request. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next question. Some financial institutions have received requests for assessments on the Paycheck Protection Program, or the PPP, created by the CARES Act. Um, the Small Business Administration is responsible for implementing the PPP and has set the eligibility criteria for small businesses to participate in the program. In light of the SBA's role in the program, why is the Bureau conducting these prioritized assessments? That's a great question because the PPP has been such an important response to the COVID-19 situation. The Bureau has supervisory authority over large insured depository institutions and insured credit unions, many of which have originated PPP loans. The Bureau also has authority to ensure compliance with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which covers business credit as well as consumer credit. Consistent with this, with this authority and with the goal of our PA program, the Bureau is requesting information related to the PPP to assess potential fair lending risk attendant to the institution's participation in the program. To assess these risks, the Bureau's targeted information requests include requests for information on one, the steps the institution is taking to ensure it complies with fair lending laws while implementing the program, two, any additional restrictions the institution has placed on PPP loans that exceed SBA's requirements for the program, and three, the steps the institution is taking to ensure the institution complies with Regulation B's adverse action notice requirements. The Bureau recognizes that institutions implementing the PPP are not expected to conduct their own independent assessment of the applicant's credit worthiness, and the prioritized assessments will not assess compliance with the underlying requirements of the PPP or the CARES Act. Do you have anything else? I do. Uh, so many financial institutions acted very quickly to implement uh, the PPP amidst a constant flow of changing guidance. The PPP is still in progress, both loan origination and forgiveness are ongoing. Will the Bureau take these circumstances into account during the prioritized assessments or consider delaying these requests until a later time when all the data is available? Another great question. Prioritized assessments are designed to obtain real-time information from supervised institutions and to help ensure that entities are attentive to practices that may result in fair lending risk and consumer harm. The Bureau recognizes that banks implemented the PPP amid tight timeframes and with evolving rules to meet statutory goals. Accordingly, examiners will conduct prioritized assessments with full knowledge and careful consideration of all relevant circumstances. 
For example, if an institution has limited information when it receives an information request on forgiveness, generally it will only need to provide the information available to it at the time of the request. Examiners will also be reasonable in considering efficient ways to seek necessary information and will consider any reasonable concerns about the request or reasonable request for extension. We have more? So another, yeah, I do. I, well, there are three more that we've received, and another follow-up question on that is whether or not or the degree to which the Bureau is coordinating with other regulators on our prioritized assessments. Well, the CFPA generally requires the Bureau to coordinate its supervisory activities with those of other regulators to reduce burden. And that's right in the statute, sections 5514 and 5515. Prioritized assessments are supervisory activities, and the Bureau is coordinating its prioritized assessment work with other regulators, as required by statute. For example, examiners are working to obtain relevant information from sister federal and state regulatory agencies and are sharing draft information requests with applicable federal and state regulators to minimize duplicative requests and reduce the burden on supervised institutions. So last one on this topic, Brian, uh, is the Bureau planning to keep the public informed of its findings during the prioritized assessments? The Bureau is indeed committed to being as transparent as possible, given the confidentiality required in supervision, about its supervisory findings. Consistent with that commitment, the Bureau, for look, the Bureau will look for opportunities whether in a future edition of supervisory highlights, a blog post, or other appropriate document, to share key anonymized findings from its prioritized assessments once they become available. Great, thank you. And one more. Does the Bureau have any financial incentives for whistleblowers who report violations of federal consumer law? Currently, no, but we would like to change that. In March, the Bureau began engaging with Congress to advance proposed legislation that would authorize the Bureau to award whistleblowers who report violations of federal consumer financial law. Such an incentive would assist in advancing enforcement cases, including with respect to fair lending violations. Under the proposed legislation, in cases where a whistleblower provides voluntary information that leads to a successful enforcement action, the Bureau will be able to pay an award based on a percentage of the monetary sanctions collected in the action. We want to incentivize whistleblowers to contact us if they know, violations, if they know about violations of the law. And we hope they'll do so now and in the future. Great, thank you, Brian. And for our participants, that was our last question. As noted at the outset of this event, if you have questions about today's session or comments, you can send those to CFPB underscore Consumer Financial Protection Week at CFPB.gov. And that concludes today's session. Thank you for joining and have a great afternoon. <laughs>